Well, certainly in large parts of Israeli society, the growth of the Haredi community has been simmering for a while. And there is a segment of the Israeli population who feel like they are the most productive citizens economically in the country. They are generating all the economic growth that this country depends on. While this Haredi community, which is growing fast and furious from their perspective, uh, not only does not contribute to the economic growth, many of them are in some sort of government assistance. And the same population that is making is the biggest contributor to Israel's economy through high tech and other parts of the economy are also the ones who are serving in the military and whose sons and daughters are risking their lives to serve in the military in order to protect the country in which this Haredi population does not serve in the military and has this exemption. So and the same population wakes up and says, we see he's leading a government populated by all these people who are making it harder and harder for us to live in this country where we pay disproportionate taxes, our children serve in the military, and these people do none of that. And now they're running the government. So judicial reform just became the match right. for these other issues. Welcome to this special episode of Call Me Back, in which we release a conversation I just had with the Commentary Magazine podcast, one of my favorite podcasts, as listeners to this podcast know. And in that conversation, we break down how Israel got to this moment, this political crisis, this judicial crisis, and where it goes from here. Now, a number of you have asked me over the last couple months, since the beginning of January, why, given that I dedicate so many episodes of this podcast generally to Israel, why we haven't had a conversation on this podcast about the judicial debate. It's largely because I felt too close to it to lead a conversation on it. I'm in regular touch with Israelis on all sides of the debate, and many of those conversations are in confidence, and I just felt like I couldn't lead a proper discussion on this podcast without compromising some of those conversations, so I just steered clear of it. But we've entered a new phase. Things have calmed down a little, hopefully, and I think I have more room in the weeks ahead to discuss where I think all of this is going and bring guests on to talk about where all this is going. In fact, later this week, we are having Yaakov Katz, the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, return to the podcast. He's a regular, very thoughtful guy following events closely, both the debate over judicial reforms, the larger political crisis, the implications for Israeli politics and the Israeli government, and then what security concerns hang in the balance that are part of the surround sound that was a motivating factor for a number of the protagonists in this debate to bring down the temperature in recent days. So today you'll hear my conversation with the crew at the Commentary Podcast and in a couple days, look out for another episode with Yaakov Katz. This is Call Me Back. Welcome to the Commentary Magazine Daily Podcast. Today is Monday, March 27th, 2023. I am John Podhoritz, the editor of Commentary Magazine. With me, as always, uh, media commentary columnist at American Enterprise Institute fellow Christine Rosen. Hi, Christine. Hi, John. Washington commentary columnist and American Enterprise Institute fellow Matt Continetti. Hi, Matt. Hi, John. And joining us today to bring uh, insight on uh, one of the most uh, interesting and dramatic stories in the world today, a man so plugged in that uh, that that his computer literally blew up because he has so much inside uh, access and information, had to reboot, we're starting late because of that, host of the Call Me Back podcast, Commentary Inc. board member, uh, author of Startup Nation, Dan Senor. Dan, John, welcome I, to the podcast. As you, I I actually thought you were having me on to talk about the season premiere of Succession, um, uh, which was which was last night, and uh, my, that was why my computer was blowing up. Just a lot uh, of commentary, a lot of reaction to the first episode. But I guess we're going to do that and then do a little bit of Israel. Okay, well, you can do that. I don't. I don't watch Succession. I know you don't. Which out of, is out of perplexing loyalty, to me. It's out of perplexing loyalty to, me. to my longtime uh, uh, friend, supporter, and and sometime em employer, Rupert Murdoch, of of whom the show is a savage caricature. But it's and, not. We don't have to get into okay, it. It's not about the Murdoch. But I, it really I just, isn't. I felt disloyal watching it, and yeah. so I didn't watch it. And okay. Also, Adam McKay makes it, and he makes me sick. So, right. uh, anyway. Uh, 
but I hope you enjoy it. I hope everybody watching Succession enjoys it because you should only enjoy. You should only thank God you have your health and you should enjoy some peak TV. But Dan, you that get that meant that you had an hour yesterday where you weren't thinking about what was going on in Israel and uh, talked about it a little bit. Uh, talked some about this on on Friday, but even since Friday, very dramatic events have happened. But I want to pull back to 30,000 feet in part because by the time people listen to this, the story is maybe shifting, may shift between the time we tape this and the time you hear it. As we're sitting here, we're waiting for Bibi Netanyahu to speak. There's some idea that he might not speak until after a possible rally of his forces in Jerusalem to counter the rally uh, of his uh, opponents uh, elsewhere. Uh, in the country, and so we don't really know what's happening. So let's pull back to the more um, Olympian view. And uh, let me, so you and I, just set this up, you and I have been texting about this heatedly and talking about it for six, seven weeks, I would say, and my line at the beginning longer, was, John, actually, the, longer. the the reform package was introduced on January 4th of this year. And oh my I think God. So it's almost three months. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We've been at it. And, OK, and, so and it's not always been friendly banter. Right. No. So you and I have had the, the, you had this disagreement at the beginning. And I think that we are maybe coming more into confluence as 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 events have progressed, which is I was on the. Fine. So they're protesting. Look, the the right coalition won the election, won 64 seats, and it ran on a series of issues. And it's trying to put these issues before the public. And uh, as as happens when you win an election and you form a government, and that's how particularly parliamentary systems work. And uh, the losers are crying foul and screaming and yelling. And so what? Like, that's so, so welcome to welcome to what it's like to lose. A lot of us have had the experience of being on the losing side for a long time or not being on the winning side. And that's life. And you you said, and particularly as the protest started, you were like, don't go that this something else is happening here. The size of these rallies and the patriotism that is being displayed by the people hostile to the Netanyahu coalition, flying the Israeli flag, talking about Israel's future, saying that they love the country too much to let the, to lose what they think they're going to lose without a fight, that this was an order of difference. Over time, as my piece in the, uh, in the latest issue of commentary indicates, I have moved closer to your view tactically, which is to say that I think that the Netanyahu government or the coalition made huge tactical errors in pushing things this aggressively. So much changed so fast. They won an undeniable election, but they did not win a landslide. They did not win a huge mandate. And they're acting like they did. And they pushed it too far. And they uh, they terrified their opponents. And they have unnerved some of their supporters with their aggressiveness and you have, I think to some extent moved toward the, you know, something else is going on here. It's not just patriotism and these protests. There's something else going on. So tell me what you think is going on. Uh, first of all, this, this, before I jump into that, you mentioned this, this um, counter rally, this rally of his supporters. I actually, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this rally, because I think it's less about, him showing dem a demonstration of Netanyahu showing a demonstration of political strength in response to the opposition's rallies and protests, but rather to show force within his own coalition because he's worried now about the coalition splintering. So I think that is as much about showing Ben Gvir and others in the coalition that that like he's still got support of the right, so you better not think you can run. But anyways, um, that's that's secondary and obviously happening in real time. Look, I my view of this from from the beginning was it is true that Netanyahu won an impressive uh, uh, election. Uh, I also never believed that he really campaigned on this issue uh, on the judicial the reform on, the ju on judicial reform. Right. So I, you know, I follow Israeli politics very closely. I was in touch with 
people who were very involved with his campaign at the most senior levels during the campaign. I mean, I just this issue just on the periphery, maybe some of them talked about it, but the people around Netanyahu uh, who were running this campaign were not focused on this issue at all. So it's not like they it's, this was not their contract with America. It's not like they campaigned on it and then they got this incredible electoral victory and then they had a mandate to go do it. So that's that's the first point. Second point is, as I said, you know, the, so the government was formed late December of last year on January 4th. Yariv uh, Levine, Levine, who's the justice minister, unveiled these reforms. So within days of the government being formed, they come out with this reform package. And th- it's just like it was full steam ahead. And it was always I always felt that there was not a the government had not the the, the political leaders leading the government had not campaigned on it, really. And B, there didn't seem to be wide support within the right on this. The most notable person who fell into that category was the prime minister. It's not clear to me that Netanyahu actually cared about these issues. When you would talk to Netanyahu, all he wanted to talk about was there was this unique moment for a variety of reasons to truly isolate Iran in a way that he felt that he felt like he failed to do the last time he was prime minister. There was a unique opportunity to expand the Abraham Accords, try to normalize with Saudi Arabia. uh, And as he put it, you know, at a normalization with Saudi Arabia would mean the end of the true end of the Arab Israeli conflict. He had all these plans and all these visions. He wasn't that interested in in judicial reform. And it was mostly a way to placate Yariv uh, Levine and to a lesser degree, Simcha Rothman, who's another key player on the judicial reforms in his government. And it, it was like to keep the whole government together. He agreed to go with this. And the Haredi parties, the Haredim, the ultra Orthodox wanted a certain piece of the judicial reforms, which we can talk about. So he kind of like, okay, like I got to keep this government together so I can do the things I want to do. And so I'll go along with these um, proposals that seem to be important to others. And then the thing took off, like, because there was this sense that this wasn't a subject of the campaign. No one was actually focused on it. They went full steam ahead within days of the government being formed. Uh, They made clear they weren't interested in any kind of... um, dialogue within the country and consensus to try to to sell it. And what we're learning now is the reason they didn't want that is not because they were worried about Yair Lapid or Benny Gantz. The architects of the judicial reforms were worried about Bibi Netanyahu. They wanted to move they this. They were trying to statement. corner him. Right. Right. Because they knew the, the first Knesset session would end this week, right before Passover, and they had a very short period of time to pass something before then. And you Yariv uh, Levine felt that the moment you make it past Pesach and you get into the next session of the Knesset, they go on holiday and then another session of the Knesset, it would lose momentum and Netanyahu would get distracted. And they had maximum capital to expend pressuring Netanyahu now. And so that that's who they were focused on. And that's why they didn't want to drag this thing out or have start getting into negotiations with other players. And, you know, we can talk about why it got too hot for the system. And there were some things that actually worried me quite a bit uh, in terms of the public's reaction. But um, but it just got it just got too, too hot for the system. And the, and the right wasn't united on it. And by the way, when you and I first started talking about it and you were you were sort of poo pooing the protests and you were calling them a bunch of, you know, you know, left wing elitists and all the rest. I, one of the reasons I disagreed with you, because I was struck by the number of people on the right not the hard right, but certainly Likud voters who were showing up at these protests. So right. that's when I, that was my, again, it was just a, a sort of anecdotal sense, but I was like, huh, like, okay, I get the big protests in, in, at, on the Ayalon and the, you know, in, in Tel Aviv. Is, think, the, yeah. is the main artery ha- highway around, right. and, and then around Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv, of course, is the liberal, is the, you know, is the. Yeah, it's a blend of New York City and of Manhattan and 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 Silicon Valley. And right. um, and so I understood I got that I got it was like after in 2017 or whenever the women's marches were after Trump was elected or after Trump was sworn in, the protests were obviously in all these big blue cities. So it made Tel Aviv is a, effectively a blue city. Um, so that made sense to me. But then I was like, OK, in Jerusalem every Saturday night after Shabbat people are showing up to protest and these are not tattoo, you know, imprinted, you know, ear, ear pierced left wing types. These are people wearing kippot. These are religious people who are showing up on Saturday nights after Shabbat in the, in the tens of thousands to protest. 
full disclosure, some members of my family, including my mother in her mid eighties. Um, these are not, um, these are people who are right of center. And um, anyways, so that's, that's where it felt like there was something bigger going on than just, just a left wing. Okay. So obviously something bigger is going on. Like there's no question that something you can't, this can't go on for three months and grow in power and grow in strength. All sorts of different things are going on. One of which is that uh, clearly they're having an impact. They're having an effect. Uh, some of those effects are very dangerous for the health of, of Israel. And, and the fact that it's, going so well for the protesters either indicates that uh, there is a social crisis in Israel that this is reflecting or it's engendering a social crisis, mainly the growth in the sense that uh, Israelis who, of course, have universal, almost universal uh, commitments to the military at the age of 18 and then remain as reservists after they leave active duty uh, that reservists were starting to claim that they would not serve or they would not go do their reserve duty, miluim, uh, when they're called to do so uh, as protest, as a protest of the government. Um, the 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 meaning of that. There have been teeny hints of this over the course of the last. 25, 30 years, uh, reservist protests against uh, the politics of the sitting government, but they're very small and they're very controversial. And this is the one moment at which this could break out, causing an immense rupture in uh, Israeli social solidarity and this sense of a totally combined of a state that understands no matter if you're, I mean, maybe if you're like really, really far, far, far on the left, you no longer have any confidence in the importance of this central commitment to the military. But 90% of the country does, or 90% of the Jews in the country do, and so we're 95% or something like that. So this is a very big deal. And this is actually what is, I think, unnerving Bibi more than anything. It's the thing he says publicly that well, and he it, is worried about. It's what led to the comments by the defense minister. Right, uh, which yes, you are provoked, Gallant, now fired. Yes, Gallant, which provoked the crisis of the last forty-eight hours. Maybe yeah. I'd love to hear Dan's thoughts on that because that seems to me what really brought this to a boiling point. Yeah, which yeah, was it's interesting before before we go into that because uh, you you've been mentioning playing a little shorthand, which is fine because you know it's very hard to pull back. Here's what's interesting: so BB is the head of the Likud party. There are I don't know seven or eight parties in the coalition. Um. This fight that he is having with Yariv Levin and Simcha Rothman is not a fight with outliers in his coalition who are demanding things that he is having to give them or the government will collapse. Levin and Rothman are members of his own party. Well, Rothman isn't. Rothman's Excuse a me. member of the National Religious Party. I'm sorry, right. But yeah. Rothman's, okay. Yeah. But Levin, who is Levin's really the real risk. Levin's the real actor, risk. Is a Le is a member of Likud, yeah. Theoretically, Bibi doesn't have to, you know, like didn't have to give him this runway. Um, and another important fissure is that we we're talking about this judicial reform having exploded. One of the reasons it exploded is that it's not a classic hot button issue that has been roiling Israeli the Israeli body politic for decades. It's not the West Bank. It's not the administration of the West Bank. It's not the disengagement from Gaza. It's not. Uh, what's going on at the Lebanese border. It's not uh, religious service in the military. It's not payments to payoffs to Haredi politics. Um, all of that is stuff that is, you know, like the minute you bring it up, it's like, oh, you're on this side and we're on that side. This looked like it was wonky policy that was being overlaid to change the character to the people who successfully seem to have won this argument that this was wonky, hard to understand policy, but its purpose was to rewrite the unwritten constitution of Israel and put it more in keeping with the interests of the more authoritarian and less right as opposed to the more libertarian left or, or something like that. And that's one of the reasons it exploded is that it did not break along conventional Israeli political lines. It wasn't like abortion in America where you can literally chart who's on what side or something like that. It was a new 
and brilliant, if you think about it, not that I think anybody did this consciously, but like there's a there's a model to follow in politics from henceforth from this, which is don't go to the obvious. See if you can organize on a slightly ancillary matter, and then might, you might be able to bring in people who are unnerved by the scope of the ambition of that wonky proposal. Aren't they unnerved because of the nature of the governing coalition? Yeah. In Israel. I mean, I think, yes. I think that if this were had been a typical BB coalition, which is Likud and then, you know, some other center right parties, maybe even a center left party, and they had gone with judicial reform, it m- would not have been, it would have been controversial because this is a major structural change to the Israeli government that they're attempting, but it would not have the, the tenor of crisis that's surrounding it. And it's because this current coalition is in partnership with Ben Gavir and with Smotrich and these parties that have never really had an, an opportunity <laughs> to rule Israel before uh, that I think is sending the shockwaves. Well, that's yeah, very I, important, but that's th- that's not what they're saying, right? They're saying we just don't like the judicial reform proposal. And Ben, but Gavir, not, but it, but it is okay, you're right, right. but but yeah. but I think but Matt, Matt is also right that this is. I mean, why did this thing get so much steam? This the reaction to the judicial reform because it wasn't just about the judicial reform. Right. I mean, it was it was so so. What was really going on? It was it was partly about the judicial reform. So some some were reacting to that. Others were reacting to the fact that Bibi got reelected in any when regardless of what government he formed. I mean, this th- imagine I mean, just to give it a, an imperfect analogy, imagine if Trump had gotten elected in 2024, reelected. I mean, imagine how people would just be going insane, like really insane. So there's an element of people just going insane. They cannot they thought Bibi was done politically and then he's back. And and I think they would have had this reaction regardless of. Uh, of what kind of the composition of of whatever government he formed, but especially to your point, Matt, the kind of government he formed, so the way he got back. And then lastly, it is a reaction to demography. It's a a reaction to Haredi, ultra-Orthodox strength. And and this is something, you know, for some on the right, the judicial reform issue has been kind of brewing for a while, even if even if it wasn't a central campaign theme. Well, certainly in large parts of Israeli society, the growth of the Haredi community has also been simmering for a while. And there is a segment of the Israeli population who you just hear it, been hearing this for years, who feel like they are the most productive citizens economically in the country. They are generating all the economic growth that this country depends on. While this Haredi community, which is growing fast and furious from their perspective, uh, not only does not contribute to the economic growth, but is actually, you know, a you know, they're they're recipients of all this growth directly. They're not they're not net contributors by and large, some exceptions. Um, so, you know, many many of them are in some sort of government assistance, and the same uh, population that is making is the biggest contributor to Israel's economy through high tech and other parts of the economy are also the ones who are serving in the military and whose sons and daughters are risking their lives to serve in the military in order to protect the country in which this Haredi population does not serve in the military and has this exemption. And so that, that, um, you know, divergence in terms of who, you know, who's, whose country is it, if you will, uh, is, has been bubbling up for a while. So that, the same, yeah. the same population wakes up and says, okay, so Netanyahu's prime minister, he's not, well, we we aren't like necessarily like terribly hostile to him for some some of the some parts of this of this uh, demographic that we're turning out in the streets, but um, but we wake up and we see he's leading a government populated by all these people who are who are who are making it harder and harder for us to live in this country where we pay disproportionate taxes, our children serve in the military, and these people do none of that, and now they're running the government. And so I just think all that got layered on. So judicial reform just became the match for these other issues. So how does he if if, go ahead? I was going to ask real quickly if if as as has been you know discussed this morning, he he, Netanyahu decides to freeze the reform effort and try to kind of backpedal and reset. 
is there something he can give those people to satisfy them or is it has it gone the ultra orthodox or the or the or the people the, opposing them the people who oppose the ultra orthodox i mean i think this is um look the, the i don't think they will be um um you know, actually mollified until Netanyahu's gone from politics. I just think they're they're amped up. I mean, one 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 of the elements of this whole protest movement is, is it got so hot, and Yair Lapid, who's who's you know the leader of the opposition, tried to kind of own this opposition, you know, own this reaction that was going on in the country, and he was you know speaking at all the rallies, but he it was the, it was almost bigger than him. Like he can't control it. Um, I mean, what is he going to say now? You know, he he. You know, uh, Netanyahu has has blinked. He's folded. Everyone, calm down. Um, I, I just think if you look at the polling, all his political strength now is is coming from this reaction to Netanyahu. I'm not so sure he's so incentivized to to tamp it down. Um, right. I, I will say the one the one worrying sign, which John you talked about a little bit uh, about a few minutes ago, that that all the leaders, in fairness, are worried about. Obviously, Netanyahu is worried about it. Gantz, Benny Gantz, who's the leader of another party, not formally the leader of the opposition, but in the opposition, blue and white, who was formerly Netanyahu's defense minister uh, two governments ago. Um, Gantz is worried about this. And even Lapid is apparently worried about it and has said some things about this idea of the reservists um, I'm taking a position not to not to show up to reserves, which, which John, you're right, it... it, it it has had last happened in 2002. Do you remember there was this, um, this, the father? Well, this Salah Shahadeh, who's this Hamas strong man that, that the, uh, that the IDF or the Air Force did an operation on where they dropped like a one ton bomb on his home in Gaza in 2002. This is before disengagement and they killed him, but they also killed 13 civilians in his home, including eight children. And there was a little bit of a backlash in in the Israeli public, small, but a bunch of Israeli Air Force pilots, reservists, uh, said wrote a letter to uh, Shul Mufaz, who was the defense minister at the time, it was Ariel Sharon's government, saying, "We're done. We're not serving. We won't. We won't show up." Um, and and this was, I think, twenty seven of them was the total number. Twenty seven. Reservists, maybe some active military, but it was mostly reservists, said that they were that this was their protest, that they thought that this was immoral. And this was a huge deal. This was a huge deal. It was debated in the Knesset what they should do about these 27 um uh members of the Air Force. They gave them the opportunity to, you know, reconsider, yeah, rethink, yeah. apologize, and then come in and apologize, explain what they're thinking. The whole thing tempered down. Now, just to get, put it in context, what really apparently flipped out Gallant to the current or up until a couple of days ago, the, the current defense minister, um, was that 200 Israeli Air Force reservists said they weren't going to show up to, for training uh, this week. So the way it works with the Air Force is if you were a reservist, so so most of the, the standing army, the IDF, is about 170,000 uh, personnel, but the reservists is, is where the real strength of the IDF comes from, which is about 465,000 in the reserves. Um, and so the... Israel's security really depends on these reservists. Now, most of these reservists have a volunteer. So if you're if you're actually in the standing army, you're you're required to serve. But the reservists, it is a volunteer-based relationship. So you're technically, you can say, I'm not showing up. Um, the problem is that the where the Air Force is the most sensitive is the you're living your normal life, you're an Air Force reservist. If you are flying fighter jets, you show up once a week to train, to fly, to get your fly time in. Like I, I, you know, over the weekend, over Shabbat, I had a, a friend over who's a, a former Air Force pilot just recently, until recently, not over this, he just aged out. Uh, he he was a venture capitalist in Tel Aviv and every Thursday afternoon, he'd go to his base and he'd fly for a few hours. And that's what they do to stay current. And the protocol apparently, uh, and I go, I've heard different views of this because it's not public information, but the pr the protocol is something like, if you miss four weeks of flying, so if for some reason you can't fly for four weeks, you're out. Meaning, not out permanently, but meaning if there's a security situation that requires the Air Force, they're not calling on you because that's how quickly you you become uncurrent if you just miss four weeks. And he told me he sometimes, if he had to miss one or two weeks, he already felt like a little soft when he was doing it. So, So for 200 of these pilots to say we're not showing up, and then if they say they're not showing up the first week, what if they the second week and third week? Now, we don't know how many pilots there are in Israel. That also is classified, right? It's a 
So the Israeli government doesn't public, publicize uh, how many pilots because it's one of their most valuable national security assets. But assume it's not a lot, right? Like it's a, it's a small number. So 200 of a small number is a lot. And the analogy this this former pilot said put to me is he says, you know, think about during COVID in the U.S. when there were all these American military personnel uh, who refused to get vaccinated, right? And so they were told they couldn't serve. So he said, so suppose a thousand American pilots, Air Force pilots said, that's it, we're not getting vaccinated, we won't serve. He's like, who cares? He said, first of all, the difference between the U.S. and America is the U.S. can fight its wars at a time of its choosing, Israel can't. So having these pilots ready to go at any moment is everything. And secondly, obviously the scale, a thousand pilots in, Israel, in the United States relative to the size of the whole Air Force is minuscule. He, he, he was, I, by the way, this is someone who was, was not as hostile to the reforms, to the judicial reforms as some of his peers in the Air Force, but he was alarmed by this number. He was alarmed by the 200 and the security implications. And so I think that that plus what was going on in some of the other units, 8200, which is the elite uh, intelligence tech unit, there was also some grumblings of of protests there. And so I just think this was coming to Gallant, as Matt said. I mean, you listen to what he said. He said the situation with the military's reaction, the reservist reaction, he, his exact words were, it is a, it is a clear, immediate, immediate, intangible threat to the security of Israel. Now, God knows what else he's seeing from an intelligence perspective, right? Like stuff's heating up with Iran, stuff is heating. There was that there was that um, infiltration from the north, from Lebanon, someone from Hezbollah broke into Israel, which was a real, which was a real worrying sign the last couple weeks. They had this like manhunt for this Hezbollah operative or whatever who had who'd gotten into Israel and was there for a few days. At any moment, there's a sense that the that the Palestinian Authority can collapse and Israel would have literally a third intifada. Um, so, yeah, you know, this is what we know from public sources. I, like I said, God knows what Gallant is seeing. So he's seeing Israel's security situation becoming more precarious at the exact same time that Israel's true most important national security resource is saying, we're not saying we're out, but we're saying we're not showing up for work. Uh I, I mean, this 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 brings up a, a question because from sort of an American perspective, you, you, we see a lot of protest movements go wrong, um, go bad. Uh, if you just sort of watch long enough, either in their tactics or they start to demand sort of extraneous things that are that are beside the initial point. Um, and then there's a sort of public turn against them. What you're talking about with the reservists is this the thing that makes it go bad or that brings uh, uh, the judicial reformers to their knees? Probably the latter. I mean, I think that's what we're going to hear today. I, I think there's no question that BB, I don't care what happens at the rally today. Dan alluded to this earlier. This is not his issue. Um, and the genius of the protests, in part, politically, is that it's now his issue, according to everybody, and that he's only really done this because he wants $270,000. He wants to get $270,000 from a dead relative. He wants the uh, prosecu you know, prosecutions of him to go away. This is all, a cor this is all his own personal corrupt intent. Um, and that's obviously... Uh, you know, it's very hard. What is he going to say? No, I don't want that. Or I, you know, what, whatever there, he has no answer. It's why this was a tough issue for them to go ahead with first, because although he wanted, I think he wanted this idea that he was, should basically re be relatively immune from prosecution or removal from office uh, or being, or, or, or not be in a position where the Supreme court, which is one of the provisions would ask him essentially like the 25th amendment to take a leave of absence until his trial was fulfilled or something like that. Some of these provisions are part of this larger judicial reform package. And it's not that he wouldn't want that. It's that this wasn't what, <clears throat> this wasn't what jazzed him. And the de to the extent that building coalitions like this uh, deal with the devil is the wrong. Uh, it's the phrase that comes to mind. I'm not 
characterizing the people that he made the deal with as the devil. It just means like making a deal with people that you might otherwise not really want to make a deal with. His political genius over the last year and he is a political genius, was to get these two disparate um, kind of right-wing extremists to join together. That's Betzel El-Smotrich and um, Itamar Ben-Gavir to come together in a coalition party so that they would uh they would hit certain landmark numbers and they, they they would be much they would be better off together because they could get more votes together than apart and they could get more seats together than apart. And he would be better off because they would go into coalition with him. They could consolidate this, not exactly Haredi. It's a whole, it's a more complicated political movement that they're part of. And he could consolidate them and bring them in, but bring them in, even though they are not the motive actors of the judicial reform either, by the way, but bringing them in which got him the coalition and got him back into the premiership then he has to run the government that they're in and you know it's like a poison chalice or it's a it's a very difficult chalice to handle because they are they're there as a constant reminder 24 hours a day two people who might otherwise want to negotiate with him or figure out how to calm this down, that if they calm it down, they're still there as the second most powerful member of the coalition, and they're going to want things. And, you know, the best thing to do might be to get BB out of office. How that happens, the only way it's going to happen, by the way, is if they pull the plug on the government. That's the other irony. Like, these Which is a possibility. Help Which is a possibility. Well, Ben Gvir is apparently saying, who's the leader of of one of these factions of the of the hardline National Religious Party. He's saying that he is he's apparently threatening to resign from the government if if um, the reforms are halted, but he will support the government in opposition. So this is the way, actually, ironically, the Arab parties have often operated in um, over in Israeli history, where they've not been part of certain governments, but they. But they have supported the government from outside, so the government still had the votes to exist, but they weren't serving in the government. So they, it, it's it's a weaker government. Okay, so let me just you mentioned you know your your friends and relatives and how they felt about what was going on, uh, and I, I'll talk about mine. Um, so but your relatives, early going of the my relatives, <laughs> my relatives. But the early going <laughs> very, of the government, it's a very Jewish was podcast, yeah, thrilling. If you were a certain type of person, and this should be very recognizable to Americans, you know, who listen to this podcast, the drinking of liberal tears, of Israeli liberal tears, the fact that they were moving on all, they were firing on all cylinders, they got in and they hit the ground running. They did judicial front, they were doing this, they were doing that, they were doing the other thing, they were pointing this, they were going there, they were going there, was like, it was like a dream come true after years of sclerosis. Like, you know, basically there hasn't been a functioning domestic government in Israel for eight years, like that could get anything done on on the domestic front. And like, not only that, but it was like everything you want, including judicial reform, which was a wonky, was a major issue in Israel among wonkier people. Not that it was like a huge populist issue, but for reasons that we've outlined before. And um, and also the fact that Rothman specifically basically said uh, Rothman and uh, and and Levin said we're not negotiating. What well, here's what we're we're the, the way this works in Israel is you have to have three readings of a bill before it becomes law, and it is in the course of that process that there are emendations made in the bill. Right, so over time. And the idea was they weren't going to negotiate. They weren't negotiating. They were going to push it through, push it through, push it through. And then, as as Haviv Redigur says in a superb piece in the Times of Israel, I commend to everybody's attention today. At the end, when 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 the train was like just about to pull into the station, maybe they would show some mercy and negotiate. So they said we're not negotiating, and and the response of the opposition was to say we're not negotiating 
you agree to negotiate or we're not we're not ending these protests and then the protests took on a life of their own this is a and so i think it felt really good felt like you know you were doing what you were supposed to do to get the government going as fast as it did and that was a huge tactical political error it was too much for the country to absorb all at once and again without a huge mandate like and there have been huge mandates in israeli political history ariel sharon's election in 2003 he got like 74 yeah. seats or something, if I remember correctly. I mean, it was a huge landslide. It's not like there haven't been these things that just level the opposition. The opposition to sh- in, in that, basically, on the issue of the Palestinians and foreign po- various other things, was basically leveled for a generation as a result of that one election. This election was just not decisive enough to level opposition to the judicial reforms in the way that they were acting as though it was. So I suppose it was worth a try. And then you just- Yeah, but John, John, can I just, I'm sorry, but please. again, I keep coming back to this point. Okay. Netanyahu is like the, is the lead, like he's like the action figure in this new government. He's the guy with the cape and the S on his, you know, shirt that came and brought the right back to life and, 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 and built this government that your family- and some members of my family, I should say, were excited about, uh, and, but that he didn't seem to be involved in any of this. So, so there's all this energy around this re- stamp, this steamroller of a reform agenda. But the one missing character now, part of it is he had an agreement uh, with the attorney general uh, that uh, in the Supreme Court that he couldn't participate in these uh, in this debate because of his own legal issues, conflict of with, interest, conflict of interest, right? Um, and so, so that constrained him and he like, just look at his schedule, right? La- this past weekend, he was in London mi- meeting with Rishi Sunak. Two weeks ago, he was in Germany meeting with Olaf Scholz. He like literally like every couple of weeks he was traveling to a foreign country. He was begging Washington, begging the Biden administration for, to give him a visit to Washington. What, what was the purpose of all these trips? Iran, he believes this is a unique moment where he thinks the Biden administration is done with the JCPOA. He believes the Biden administration now is very frustrated with Tehran because of what they're doing to support Putin in its war in Ukraine. He thinks that that a number of European countries are now more open on a harder line, remains to be seen what, on Iran that they haven't in the past. So he thought, that, and then he had Saudi. I mean, he thought this was his moment. Yeah. That's how he wanted to be spending his time. So yeah. it's one thing to say, that there are people in Israel who are so excited that this new government was formed and that they're go- they're owning the libs, if you will. The one person who didn't seem that excited about it was the prime minister. Well, and this but controversy this is, is eroding his ability to conduct this diplomacy. And I just, I mean, a couple of things. One is, it's funny what Dan said that this the judicial reform was not what the coalition really campaigned on. As I recall, the central issue in the election was public safety yep. and decline in the rule of law. And the I, one of the reasons Ben Givier was so successful is he was going to say, finally, you know, the gloves are coming off. Ironically, what's happened since? <laughs> I mean, the public safety and the rule of law is deteriorating. Um, More Israelis have been killed in the last few months than all of last year, which was a bigger right. number than like the last 10 years. So right. The, and and the fact that now you have reservists not saying that they're not going to show up for duty. I mean, that is a direct rebuke to the to the rule of law and and. I mean, it's a, a, a conscious one. Um, it reminds me a little bit of George W. Bush running for re-election on the basis of his national security bona fides and then turning around saying, hey, I'm going to reform Social Security. That is, right? a, that is a really, really good analogy. And there's another interesting analogy. Dan, of course, was in Iraq as a, you know, as a, a spokesman, you know, for the uh, for the American effort after the after the initial hostilities concluded in 2003 and i remember um so not to mention another family member but my brother-in-law elliot abrams who was working in the bush white house coordinating middle east policy bush's focus this is where you can't you know bush's focus in april may of 2003 was no famine. There was worry that there was going to be there was going to be a terrible crisis in the delivery of food and 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 goods, and that and that Elliot was to focus his attention on making sure that 
you know, that this was not a crisis. And uh, he did. I mean, they did. And this was very important. It was not that it wasn't a thing to think about. It just meant that they didn't see what was coming from the other angle. You know what I mean? It's like, it's an interesting thing where politicians get fixated or fixed on one thing, or they think they're doing something good and noble or something like that. And and they can check it off in a box and say, okay, I've handled this. I can go on. And you just don't know where things are coming from. And it may be that Bibi, who is 74 years old, simply doesn't have the, um, I don't know what you would call them, the, the instincts or the or the flexibility to, to move uh, with the issue um, and, and fo- stay focused on his thing when fought, you know a bb 10 years ago would have seen these protests building up and probably would have responded to them immediately or he's in fact he did in 2011 there were protests the in economic protests. social right food rent right you know, inflation protests and he jumped and all over it he jumped all over i mean i don't know he didn't and this was much, not an but... issue he cared about and he pivoted you're right john there were there were twenty thousand people with tents in the streets of Tel Aviv, and it I, I remember being there at that time, that summer with a, with a congressional delegation, and they were like, what the hell is going on in this country? I mean, it was like it looked looked like a bad version, a worse version of San Francisco today. And Netanyahu, this is the last thing he wanted to work on, and he jumped all over it, and he put together that that uh, Man- Manuel Trachtenberg Commission, an economic commission, and he, he, he made it his issue. So, you know... You but, want to, if you're a politician, you always want to talk about what I, you want to talk about. And I, I, I do think we should talk about Biden here, though, because what you know, Dan is saying that he, uh, Bibi, may have spied an opportunity to uh, rally a coalition against Iran, to expand the Abraham Accords, and going into the government, that was all that we were hearing um, from his allies. Um, and uh, Biden's actions here uh, are very troubling to me. Um, you know, on the one hand, you have uh, this new uh, Chinese brokered Saudi Iranian alliance or rapprochement, detente. And the Biden administration is like, yeah, sure, good with us. We'll see what happens. Uh, over the weekend or, or toward the end of last week, the Joint Chief of, uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, said that, well, you know, with Iran, we're really concerned if they, uh, with the fielded weapon. Now, this is, I mean, this is a very close reading. But that is different from saying Iran will never get a nuclear weapon, a fielded weapon. I mean, what, what is that? you know, you, you're going to let them move it out on the track, uh, the track like uh, like uh, Kim Jong Un. And that's when you're going to take action. And we continue to get from the Biden administration the sense that, yes, you know, the JCPOA may be dead now. We don't really see any um current hopes for revival. But you know, if Iran wants to return to the track of diplomacy, we're willing to accept them. Meanwhile, in the midst of all of this, and all the protests that were triggered by Gallant's firing by Netanyahu uh, over the weekend, the National Security Council issues a statement. We're very concerned. We're very concerned with the judicial reform. We're very concerned about what it means for liberal values and democratic values in Israel. Now, you know, France is burning too. And I don't see the National Security Council issuing a statement saying we're very concerned about Macron and what's happening in France. So I think there's a there's a, if Bibi really thinks he can work with the with the Biden administration here, he he might have to think again. Well, I okay, so I the last role I want to play on the commentary podcast is defending <laughs> the Biden administration. So <laughs> I, I I I'm that is that is not why John called me on. It's always right, a thankless job. Thankless <laughs> job, exactly. Um so that said, um I I I don't think the comparison to what's happening in France works because what's happening in France, which is by the way fascinating, uh is not does not actually have implications for the stability of geopolitics. And I I think the Biden administration looks at some of the players that were populating Netanyahu's government and saying, these guys are maniacs. Ben Gvir, Smoltrich. I mean, you know, Smoltrich last week, he's standing with a map that doesn't have, um, th- th- there's no presence of, of uh, you know, the P- Palestinian territories on it. 
Um, you know, I mean, I, we can go on and on. Ben Smoltrich basically having a, his own office in the defense ministry. He's like a quasi defense minister. Ben Gvir overseeing the police on the heels of like what 70, 80,000 people were showing up, planning to show up for Ramadan at the at the uh, at uh, last week in the uh, Dome of Ro- the Rock. I mean, it's just like th- there's it's a little bit of a powder keg and they're pushing these um these outposts that are very controversial even in israeli circles uh, uh annexing these uh, these parts of the west bank and building these settlements so i i, I think that Biden administration is not necessarily reacting to judicial reform like like so many in israel it's, it's like about judicial reform but it's not about judicial reform and i think the Biden administration it's like sure they're commenting on judicial reform but that's not really what they're commenting on what they're commenting on is who's in charge of this crazy government from their perspective and they may do something stupid that could like you know, light up the region. I think that's overwrought. I don't think that's going to happen. But, you know, that is the mindset of administrations generally, Democrat and Republican. They're worried about some provocative action by a right wing member of an Israeli government that suddenly just creates a headache. And one thing the Biden administration does not want between now and November of 2024 are headaches in the foreign policy scene. They just okay, I want one- quiet. I also do not want to defend the Biden administration. I just do want to say one thing, which is you know what this would have been like had Biden's former boss been president. They would prefer never to say the word Israel if they could help it. They don't want to be involved in this. Thomas Nides, the the ambassador, does not want to be a central player in a domestic Israeli dispute, as opposed to his opposite number, his, his predecessor, uh, you know, Martin Indyk in the in the uh, in the uh, Obama administration, who wanted nothing more than to be, who, by the way, Prime flew Minister. Israel to join the protests. I think about yeah. that. He's a former U.S. ambassador to Israel. He's no longer ambassador. He went to Israel to show solidarity with the protesters. Yeah, it's, yeah. If, no, but I mean, I mean just he wanted push... to be prime minister of Israel. Biden would like that's all. I'm not defending right. their conduct. But, but when do you mean... agree, though, that. As I, I agree. The most yeah. important words in life are compared to what? Compared to the Obama administration, the Biden administration's response is preferable. However, wouldn't you also agree that Biden would prefer that this government collapse and oh, Benny yeah. Gantz become the prime minister of Israel or somehow Yair Lapid is able to get to a high level? I mean, I do think what we have seen since this coalition came to power and Biden waited forever to mm-hmm. give a call to, to Bibi. You mm-hmm. you have gone in the cold shoulder to Bibi. Now, maybe that's part partly because of the characters involved in the coalition. But I also do think that uh, Biden, yes, I, I agree. He's not as bad as Obama. <laughs> At the same time, I think that he, see, he they see an opportunity here. They would rather that this coalition disappear and someone more, uh, uh, a government of more of like mind come to power. Well, well, let's talk about that for a minute, because this is actually where things get get in, because Christine sort of alluded to this also. Bibi will probably announce some kind of a freeze or compromise or something today, or if not today, by Wednesday. I mean, he fired Gallant three days ago, and he's now essentially going to adopt Gallant. And by the way, everything has to stop, really, because Passover kicks in. The, I mean, the, the yeah. country shuts down. Yeah, so. that's a week from Wednesday. So, yeah, so but that's the Knesset session is supposed to go till Thursday. There's not much time. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, it's the it's the street theater that is going to have a hard time shutting down. It is supercharged. It is emotionally wrought. It is thrilled. It is you know, in a state of high dudgeon, high excitement, high enthusiasm. If you w- listen to interviews and stuff with people on the street, they seem mashuga, and that includes friends of mine who were tweeting out mashuga pictures <laughs> of themselves cheering in the streets of Tel Aviv. Uh, so it's going to be very hard for them to back down. And this, I think, is the ultimate thing I want to ask you, Dan. If because I, I mentioned this to you in a in a in a text, but um, what's interesting to me is that the emotions seem very c- comparable to Paris in '68, May the May '68 um, revolution in Paris. Except, and this is why, because that that came to nothing. But 
it, it, I mean, it revolutionized French society in many ways, but it came to nothing politically or didn't come to much politically because, okay. So here, the thing is that that was a war, a revolt against an, a, a, a sclerotic establishment. Here, this is an establishment revolt against uh, a resurgent populist resentful, you know, underclass, whatever you want to call it. And it turns out that's a really exciting model for a revolt because you have the newspapers, you have the universities, the universities shut down today in solidarity. Every, everybody the, shut down the Histadrut, the big national labor right. union shut down. They shut down the airport. I mean, they, right. they so shut the down the country. Route, which is basically BB's own like, a defense attorney on case 4000 said, I'm not, I can no longer work for you. Like the, like literally yeah. every, the New York, yeah. the consul yeah. general so in New York. Like, say, it's yeah. like, if you have the levers of the establishment and you're doing a protest against unjust gov, this is, that's like, I don't know. It, there's no, I can't think of anything comparable. Maybe the, maybe the pussy hat scenes of 2017, but of course they didn't have any legislative um for any, and, and so it's going to be hard for them to step down. It's an amazing kind of achievement of organization and tactics and stuff like that. But Biden may want the government to collapse. If it collapses, the results are not going to be markedly different. I don't think, I don't think you're going to get a left of, you're going to get a, a centrist government that replaces this government. I mean, who? First there's all, no way of knowing. There's no but way. But I mean, so you know. volatile, and Netanyahu may swap out Smoltrich, Ben Gvir, and try to bring in Gantz. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of to, to create a kind of government that resembled what governments he's had in the past. To Matt's point, I mean, it, who, who knows? I will say though that what worries me, you know, there, there were there were some very worrisome um, uh, developments that happened over the last few weeks. And there were some very actually heartening and, and, and encouraging the worrisome is this, again, I keep coming back to it. This reservist revolt is just something that went to a whole other level. And, you know, I'm just trying to think the implications. If you look at the Israeli, uh, military, it's increasingly being populated, not dominated, but increasingly populated by, by young national religious Israelis, right? Keep wearing people like, you know, um, Bennett, you know what I mean? People, former Prime Minister Bennett. I mean, people like the, that from that, not not Ben Gvir and Smoltrich types, but real uh, impressive young Israelis who who become officers and serve in elite units, but are very religious and very conservative, very right wing. So what happens 10 years from now, say, if there's a left wing government that wants to do a version of the 2005 disengagement from Gaza, but they're going to do some kind of disengagement from the West Bank and they have to do what... Sharon did in 2005, which is forcibly remove, you know, thousands of Israelis from their homes and dig up cemeteries and all that. Imagine 10 years from now, a left wing government has to or a centrist government has to do that in parts of the West Bank. And they tell the army to do these forcible removals. And these young soldiers say, I'm out. Reservists say, I'm out. I'm not doing it. There's precedent for it because in 2023, all these. I mean, I just I yeah. that. Well, this, that's, in that's that why sense, you breach. Yeah, you 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 break a you break a guardrail, and you can't just. Can I can I tell a quick family story? Then we got to go. But I got to tell another. And then, and then I got to say one positive note. But okay. go. You but go about the it. about the disengagement. So I want to give you an example of this. Two thousand five, the disengagement. My my nephew alone was in Gaza. Uh, very much opposed to the disengagement. He had to go, he had to climb into windows and pull people out of their houses. And as he was doing it, he was sobbing and they were sobbing. But these were his orders. He was a, he, he wasn't a reservist then, he was in active duty. But I mean, this is what you do when you are in the military. You are not policymakers, you are the military of a democratically elected government that is doing what it, you know, what right. we elect people to do, which is to fill out policy based on what they run on. And uh, they did it. A lot of people were there in 2005 hating the disengagement, and they did what they had to do under the classic rules of serving in, in the military. And I think this example that you give, Dan, of what happens if this if service in the military becomes 
conditional in the minds of Israelis about the justice or value or virtue of the task that they are being asked to perform, that in a country as it's not that ideologically divided, it's less ideologically divided than we realize, actually, uh, when it comes to sort of, st- you know, like 90% of people in Israel believe that they need to do what they're doing on Iran, or even more seriously, for example. But uh, that's a huge thing. And we can see that as a kind of, that's the Rubicon. You know, you yep. if that if that happens, there is a, the country has a huge problem okay d- please do right, my positive my, my positive note is you you alluded to this early on john i i and i i have been saying this to you throughout the protest but i'll i when we've been bantering about it i i still i moved every saturday night when i watch these protests because the people showing up it's just you see a sea of israeli flags they're singing hatikva israel's national anthem if you look at the signs become people have these very creative signs that they you know and they so many of them are about honoring Israeli history, honoring Zionism, um, uh, honoring Jewish history. There's there's quotes, you know, from biblical quotes. I mean, th- th- these are not these are people who've served in their country. They're proud of their country. They love their country. This is you you, you can't compare this to the Black Lives matter protests after after George Floyd or the protest after Trump was elected you you wouldn't be able to find an american flag being waved people weren't th- this wasn't an indictment of their country they love their country like i said many of these people protesting are people who've served their country so it in that sense it, it was a very different kind of protest i think the, the, a lot of pundits over here want to categorize it as like well there's the reaction to this and the happening in brazil and there's the reaction in the us Th- this this is different um, and and in that sense, moving. Uh, and then the other point I would make is, as much as we're going to be reading over the next few days about Israeli society is broken and it's being torn apart, and obviously there are fissures in in the society. At the same time, there are these like incredible images, like of this protest of these secular Israelis that marched on Bnei Barak uh, last week. This this ultra orthodox town, you know, is in the context of all these protests, and they marched in and these Haredim. We're coming out to the protests on Thursday and Friday morning, I guess, or Thursday and feeding them cholent, like cholent they had made for Shabbat. And they're feeding the protesters. And there's this one video that was moving around social media. I'll, I'll tweet it out. It was it was of a of a of a Israeli guy who's clearly going to protest in Bnei Barak against the Haredim. And he's wearing a helmet because he thought he was going to get pelted by the Haredim. And he gets to Bnei Barak and he realizes that they disagreed in- intensely, but there's going to be no violence. There's going to be no. They're, again, they're bringing them chillant, and they're blasting from the apartment buildings the, the the inhabitants, the residents of the community. Shalom Alechem, the, the uh, an Israeli song, and he's so moved by the moment that, while on one hand he's kind of politically at war with these people, that they're like embracing him and they're all brothers. He takes off his helmet and he starts singing with them, and he's like crying. It's an amazing image, and you so you were seeing pocket, of course. The press over here won't cover this, but there there was something underneath these fissures that remind you that the fissures are are about debates over politics. But they, I I still will bet on the strength of Israeli society holding together. Dan Senor, as ever, unbelievably uh, illuminating. Uh, listen to the Call Me Back podcast uh, wherever you get your fine podcast. Great one this week with Josh. Rogan talking about China and and Ukraine very uh, as illuminating as his comments here and Matt and Christine. I, I won't ask course. John, by the way, why yeah. Abe is on the commentary podcast this morning and not on his honeymoon. But we can we can you can hit that. Uh, Doesn't the guy so get a Abe, break? Do you want Doesn't to get a break? Take a quick uh, because he can't stay away. I think what what's going on in Israel was too important. I had to be here. It's the fate go. of Zion. Well is played, state. Abe. Well played. Without missing a beat. <laughs> Thanks for listening to my conversation on the Commentary Podcast. I highly recommend you subscribe to it and also subscribe to the magazine. And there's tons of content on their website. And again, their daily podcast is terrific. And look out for another episode to drop in your feed from Call Me Back, which will be my conversation with the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, Yaakov Katz, later this week. Call Me Back is produced by Alon Benatar. Until next time, I'm your host, Dan Senor. Dan Senor.